Hello, everyone. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're located, uh, and welcome. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Nordin Taj, and I work for BP in, 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 uh, as an architect in digital innovation and engineering. I'm an honor to moderate today's panel with my ex fellow experts. So before we get into the exciting discussion on how we can reduce carbon footprint from an oil and gas platform with electrification, and what role hydrogen plays to achieve net zero goals. I would like to share a few facts uh, that was uh, discussed during the recent uh, climate conference held in Glasgow. And uh, this was from uh, McKinsey's uh, presentation. So there is much to celebrate since Paris Agreement was signed six years ago on climate change. Transition to net zero is complicated. We need to take practical steps to decarbonize the assets and reduce emissions to build resilience and build sustainable business. Net zero equations can be solved by technology, infrastructure, natural resources, and the rightful capital reallocations towards green projects. And we can achieve the path to 1.5 degree by deploying technologies. And we can talk about, you know, we will discuss more about electrification and hydrogen but in 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 general you know if you break it up the technology can solve these problems so there are a lot of mature technologies which are which just needs to be deployed and that will contribute to 20 28 percent and there are early adopters which will contribute 32 percent and then some of the technologies which has really demonstrated value in removing carbon which will contribute 26 percent and there is still room for 14% for new technologies to be researched, uh, you know, I mean, R&D um, will, will be able to pick up the remaining 14%. With that said, I would like to introduce our expert panelists, and I will, I think it will be justice if uh, they introduce themselves rather than me. So I would start with uh, the David. David Granger, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is David Granger. I am a leading advisor working in Equinor on low carbon value chains. Steve Freeman. Hi everybody, great to be here today. So Steve Freeman, I am the head of energy transition for the digital and integration side of Schlumberger. That covers all things around emissions reduction, uh, carbon capture and storage and low carbon energy generation uh, around the world. Paul. Hi, everybody. My name is Paul Doucette. I work for Baker Hughes. I'm part of the energy transition team. And in, in my area of responsibility is policy, funding, stakeholder engagement around the world. David Hartel. Yeah, hi, Dave Hartel. I'm the managing director of Stellae Energy here in the UK. Neil. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Neil Pickering. I work for Bureau of Veritas Solutions and my um, role is Global Strategic Sales and I'm predominantly and primarily focused on energy transition and solutions to net zero. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. Um, a good introduction and nice to have you all in this panel and looking forward to exciting conversation today. So let's start with uh, with uh, I'll uh, start with the you know the t for the topic we will cover is uh, platform electrification to reduce emission. And my first question: Let's uh, have our panelists discuss it and and provide their feedback on why decarbonize platform in the first place. Uh, Production emission only a minor part of uh, oil and gas emissions. So why, what do you think, you know, the decarbonization of uh, the platform will play a big role in energy transition? I can start with David. Sure. David Granger. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So, I mean, probably 85% um, of the emissions is coming from, you know, the end use of the, of the oil and gas. Um, and a lot less upstream. So why why would you spend the, the effort to to decarbonize operations offshore? Um, there are actually a number of good reasons. So the first is that you're you have to meet uh, national obligations in in reducing CO two emissions, and um, especially in a country like like Norway, where a large proportion of your emissions are from off, offshore oil and gas production, it makes sense that you have to target those two. So Equinor has um, a target of 40% uh, reduction of CO2 emissions by 2030. And offshore emissions reduction is also an important part of the total 
net zero target in 2050. Um, the other reason is CO2 taxes and fees to avoid those. There are very precise instruments in, in attacking CO2 emissions, and they've been very effective in, in, on the Norwegian continental shelf for the last decades. Um, the third reason I think is the most long-term strategic region, reason, and that's that um, if you're going to do decarbonization of the entire gas chain, so if you're intending to do low carbon power or low carbon hydrogen production, then you need to also target the upstream CO2 emissions to get a full full de decarbonization of, of the chain. So we've gone through a bit of an evolution in thinking in Equino, I think, when before it was perhaps more a case of implement, implementing measures that will um, will have an abatement cost that's less than the CO2 taxes and fees that you have at that time or that you can see uh, will, will come about in the future. Um, now the thinking is, is more complex in that we, we see some of the measures to off, you know, reduce offshore CO2 emissions are also a good way to kickstart new value chains. And they can be integrated into energy hub uh, thinking. So we have an industrial plan, for example, in Norway called Norway, Norway Energy Hub. Its pillars are increased wind production offshore, export of clean power to, to Europe and also use in, in, in Norway. We have hydrogen production in both green and blue and uh, export again to Europe and, and, and also use to stimulate uh, low carbon industries in Norway. And uh, this picture wouldn't really be complete without the fourth pillar, which is to, to also decarbonize the offshore um, oil and gas production. So it's really part of, a, of an integrated picture. Thanks. Nodin, you're on mute, unfortunately. Sorry, um, Steve. Do you have any comment, or anyone else would like to comment on this? Yeah, I, yeah, glad to. I, I think you know it's you know with COP26, with Paris, you know the world wants to achieve net zero across the entire globe. It's therefore um, a responsibility for all industries, regardless of where they are in the value chain, as well as all consumers, to be able to to target decarbonisation and to do that as rapidly as possible. So, you know, yes, there are large amounts of emissions coming from end use, but that doesn't dissolve um, our industry from the responsibility of decarbonising all of our operations. And so, hopefully, you know, panels like this are, are excellent ways that we can actually drive uh, that agenda. It's good for the planet. It's also good for the uh, the financial performance of our companies. Uh, no, no, I'd, like, I'd like to ahead, uh, yeah. add to that, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I mean, let's not forget that the there is um, significant influence coming from the investor community in this in this market and every other market. So, um, and when the investor community asks for something, generally. Uh, they, they get a response. Yeah, this, this Paul, I, you know, from our perspective, I, I'm going to go off off with the rails here just for a minute. And here in the U.S., back when the shale revolution began, the term social license to operate became very, very common, very commonly used. And it really related to the ability of the industry to function in a particular onshore basin. We, we believe that the social license to operate has morphed into the social license to exist. And unless or until the industry really comes to grips with all of the emissions along the value chain from scope one through scope three or whatever, um, we are going to be threatened as an energy source for the future. So our view is that it isn't the fuels that are the problem, it's the emissions that are the problem. And, and as a result, we have to tackle those emissions from every source along the value chain. Thanks, Paul. David, do you have a comment? Yeah, sure. Um, just some technical kind of points of view. The, uh, the reduced emissions, uh, you know, power generation has been estimated to be two thirds of the, the emissions from oil and gas uh, production facilities offshore. So power generation has been a great place to uh, to go after to see can we uh, do something about that, and the idea of of going to electric drive compressors, pumps, things like that um, has been uh, discussed from a, a couple of perspectives. One 
perspective, of course, after the emissions reduction is is safety. Uh, we're we have hazardous areas on our facilities where, of course, the well production comes in or the risers. But when you have fuel gas systems routed around the platform, those are also places for potential leak and potential um, uh, safety issues. Uh, rotating equipment can have a lot of noise and vibration, which has some uh, some HSE issues for the people working on board. Uh, Value. I always like to, to tell people the idea, uh, why burn hydrocarbon molecules offshore when we can sell them? So the idea of, uh, of electrification appeals to me. And we have various ways. I think we're going to talk about a little bit later in the panel about how to come with that electricity. But uh, Norway has been a good leader um, getting electrification from shore. We have very much larger onshore power generation facilities, which um, might have up to double the efficiency of a of a power generation unit offshore on a platform. So it's uh, cheaper, better, and uh, uh, less emissions, possibly even carbon capture and storage with the onshore plants. So the idea of bringing a power cable offshore. Uh, having electric drive uh, equipment, um, people are looking at high-speed direct drive motors without gearboxes, with magnetic bearings, uh, it's been leading to a 50% weight and 60% footprint uh, reduction. So again, there's technical advantages and, and variable drive compressors or pumps have, uh, have less maintenance with uh, electric drive. So there's some, there's some technical reasons to go with that. And, and once we get this electrification, we can probably focus more on uh, spurious methane emissions, which can be worse than uh, CO2 emissions. So uh, if you can reduce the, the burning of hydrocarbons on the platform and then really just focus on where methane might be leaking from. That's it. Good point. Uh, good point, David. Uh, so now let's go, uh, you know, continue our discussion on this. And so we established, you know, electrification has add values, you know, in carbon re reduction. So let's talk about challenges. What are the challenges of electrification for onshore versus offshore platforms? David uh, Granger, do you want to start or? Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> a number of challenges, I guess, with electrification. And um, the first thing, of course, is, is is starting at the source. You need to have a reliable supply of, of, of power and a, a strong grid connection, no bottlenecks in the area. Um, we're talking about large capacities, which offshore um, uh, installations need one gas turbine that you're replacing offshore is you know 20 25 megawatts of power you can have two three operational plus uh compressor drivers so so you, you need reliable power offshore um another aspect is how far from shore you are and um and, and the capacity you need because at some point you need to go from alternate alternating current which is relatively cheaper to implement to to go into high voltage DC, and that can necessitate a new platform offshore. Um, if I can mention one more, I think it's um, the electrification of existing platforms, uh, particularly older platforms, crowded platforms, and and full electrification where you need to remove gas turbines driving compressors and pumps and replace them electrical motors can be a large and a tricky offshore ground, brownfield scope. So I'll, I'll start with those three and hand over to the rest of the panel. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, David. Steve, you have any comment or uh, anyone else? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there are many challenges with electrification. I mean, if you can, if you can electrify all of the components, as David uh, um, alludes to, there are challenges in, in just ensuring you can swap out to electrical equipment. But then how do you supply that electricity to that platform? You know, so if you are close to shore, the costs are relatively low and you've got essentially a guaranteed high volume of electricity you can supply, which in places like Norway is 100% renewable. So that works very effectively. The challenge comes that the cable is incredibly expensive. So the further you go offshore, you know, the more dramatically the prices go up and it, it's hundreds of millions of dollars uh, to be able to, to put one of these cables uh, in. So that's that's the main challenge is distance uh, from shore. Once you get far enough away from shore, then you need to think about are there local energy sources there that you can use? And that's talking then to 
primarily fixed or floating um, offshore wind. At that point, you then need to start thinking about the intermittency challenge um, of that type of energy. And that's where the hydrogen and the energy storage uh, will need to come in. So it's a non-trivial problem. It's driven by economics as well as uh, engineering uh, viability. But I think all of the people here, which is fantastic, are all very much focused on uh, implementing these solutions uh, in the short term. Thanks, uh, Steve. Anyone else? Any comment? I guess but I, again, I the, could the add that. Challenge. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I guess uh, I can David. add that there are sort of three, there are three main jobs of a gas turbine offshore. And the first is to to generate electrical power. Uh, the second is to drive you know, large pumps and 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 uh, compressors. And the third is also to produce heat. So the heat is used in the separation processes. And if you go for full electrification, then you need to find a way to solve all those three. So um, yeah. So, so my question, another question is that, do we have a challenge of finding the replacement? Uh, do we have all electric, uh, electric equipments available? Um, it's, it's the power, providing power is, a, is an issue, is a challenge, but we have to have a replacement uh, product as well, right? Or the equipment as well, which can work on electricity versus the, you know, the natural gas or any other fuel. Uh, yeah, I could have a comment on that. So so inside Schlumberger, I guess over the last three years now, we've been uh, designing um, fully electric um, well systems, uh, subsurface systems, um, and kind of platform operating and, and uh, well drive, uh, well construction drive systems. Um, those first kind of went to some of our kind of onshore operations and they're plans to um, roll those out onto offshore things over the next kind of 12, 18, uh, 24 months. So all of the, the rig providers, the service companies, the operators have been very much focused on how do we make sure we can identify those electrification components to be able to do those swaps. Most, I think we have solutions for. There are still some areas which are uh, in need of, uh, of further work though. Yeah, David's point about heat. David's point about heat was a good good reminder. We we actually have uh, floating FPSOs that are all electric except for the power generation unit at the back, and and that heat is used depending on uh, what your your well stream is, whether you need uh, additional heat to heat with the processing or not, or whether you're trying to uh, remove uh, um, contaminants from the gas before you export it. So I think that's an important challenge that uh, that we should keep in mind. Paul, were you saying something? Or is David, go ahead. No, I'll pass. Let David go. Okay, David. Thanks, Paul. So I, I just also to answer your question, Audi, um, so this, the solutions are there for electrif electrification and, and replacing all of these three these fu functions. Um, electrification isn't anything new. I mean, we had um, electrification of Troll back in 1996. A, and the latest is uh, Johan Sverdrup field, which is when phase two starts up, we'll have 300 megawatts of, of capacity, electrical capacity. So I think the solutions are, are there. It's it's the difficulty is, is in a case by case <laughs> for the for each platform and its, yeah. partic its particular yeah, its peculiarities. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Paul. Nurdin, I think we're gonna. I think we have to be creative, right? I, I recall a story of a, an LNG provider here in the in the U.S. that wanted to begin to um, uh, decarbonize their operations, and they had trouble getting um, power to their facility because of their location. So they they had to design and develop their own power island. And I think perhaps when we think about some offshore, I think about the Gulf of Mexico or the North Sea, where where the distances aren't quite so great between platforms, we may have to be thinking about how to how to create a power island to to, to generate electricity and then distribute it to the nearby platforms. The long distance tiebacks are a real costly and 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 uh, concerning challenge from Baker's view. It's great, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Um, 
before I have a question, actually a final question on this. So we established, you know, that yeah, decarbonization require electrification on onshore and offshore platform. We talked about, uh, you know, the challenges and the steps to achieve, you know, to overcome those challenges. So in your view, anyone, you know, what is the biggest challenge that you see that we have that we need to overcome in order to transform completely, you know, into electrifying the platform? Onshore versus offshore, both, if you look at it. Go ahead, uh, Neil. Yeah, I mean, um, we talked about electrification, which is absolutely valid and, and is probably the most readily available option at the moment in terms of whether it comes from shore, whether it comes from offshore. But let's not forget that there's, there are other potentials in the pipeline as well for decarbonisation and power generation on platforms through alternative fuels, hybrid systems, etc. So, you know, hybrid systems have been used very successfully on ships. Um, alternative fuels have been tested out on, on marine going vessels. So... Um, the electrification, like you say, is the is kind of the most available, I guess, to us at the moment. But um, you know, the future might unfold, and uh, there might be alternatives to getting in there. So, in terms of uh, the challenges, the immediate challenges for me, and in, in terms of the electrification as it goes now, I think we've probably covered most of them. It's you know, how close to shore are you in terms of um, getting the power to the platform? And I think David pointed out as well, you know. Let's not underestimate, if you're going to put electri electricity directly onto a platform, there are significant modifications and upgrades required to house that, just the switch gear alone and the, the kind of associated electrical equipment. So um, the UKCS, the carbon taxing is not, uh, is not um, high enough to tip some of these over the edge at the moment. Uh, if carbon taxes go up in the UKCS, as they have in Norway, then uh, we'll probably see a lot more effort being put into moving a lot more platforms to alternative power sources. That's great. Thanks. Uh, David, you had a comment? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm glad you brought that up, Neil, because electrification is, is, say, maybe the main tool or the most implemented tool. Um, but there is a toolbox here for decarbonization. It starts right at the improvement of efficiency on board and um, reduction of power use on board and that's where we should start right uh, because then you need to electrify less <laughs> um, so you know looking at your pumps your compressors how they're operated are they oversized do they need to be rebundled um, and that's on the one the one side of scale can you add bottoming cycles to your single cycle gas turbines and then on the other the other end um, we have what's you know coming in the in the research pipeline and you mentioned a few there so fuel switching um, CCS offshore, compact CCS offshore. So there's other exciting developments, which, um, which are, you know, perhaps a little further down the road, but uh, shouldn't be ignored. Thanks, David. Uh, any final comment on this topic? Oh, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, yeah one just ahead. final thought. I, I certainly agree with with uh, Steve and David and the others on the cost issues, but I'd, I'd like to also insert the thought about certainty. Right. If you're going to ask your customers to invest millions, hundreds of millions, perhaps of dollars in, in additional equipment or replacement equipment, then knowing from a government policy and regulatory perspective that that solution is going to be acceptable moving into the future, I think, is an important piece of this, um, especially if you're talking about um, uh, some sort of a hybrid um, onshore, you know, blue hydrogen, with, including CCUS or something like that, I, I think there's a, a certainty element that, that perhaps some of the operators need to be more comfortable with where regulations are going than, than perhaps they are at the future, at, at the moment, rather. Excuse yeah, me. yeah, that's, that's a good point, Paul. And then, then uh, going back to my original comment about reallocation of funding, you know, or the capital, um, that is also important to you know, to move towards uh, greener uh, you know processes anyone else any final comment before we move on to the next topic uh, yeah I just um, essentially kind of uh, agreeing with David's point here I mean there is a stepwise journey on this process some things can be electrified easily and that's great and particularly the new developments um, but other ones, we should be looking at how do we drive substantial amounts of energy efficiency you know can we do uh, 
subsea boosting systems which can cut dramatically the overall energy consumption on these kind of systems. So driving energy efficiency across all of the elements, as well as looking at the overall how to decarbonize the entire portfolio of platforms, um, not just looking at potentially one platform at a time, because we want to reduce the overall emissions from the industry, not just from one point system. So I think we need a, a bigger view um, of this to be able to give the most value for money and the most rapid decarbonization. Great, thanks, uh, Steve. Uh, so now let's move to the next topic. So let's talk about uh, the emergence of floating wind turbine. So my first question, uh, probably David, if you can talk a little bit more about why floating wind versus fixed base. Sure. I mean, assuming David Granger, but yes, we can, we can, we can. I mean, we can start with um, you know the, the the general benefits of, of offshore wind, um, mm -hmm. in that you know you have um, you have more consistent wind, you have higher wind speeds offshore compared to onshore. Uh, so basically high quality wind, higher capacity factors. You, um, you're you not competing for land and um, you have uh, a lower noise impact. And then floating wind on top of that, the fact that you can deploy floating wind in deep water extends the area that you can deploy it you know, massively. I think 66% of the of the Earth's, Earth's surface is covered in water that's more than 200 meters deep. So that's that's floating wind. Um, you also have more freedom to to locate your floating wind parks closer to large users, which happen to have deep, deep water up to the coast, so you can be more you know, targeted. Um, and you can also locate floating wind parks um, you know, outside of bird migration routes and, and, and so on. So there's there's a number of, of, of benefits in addition to offshore wind uh, in general. Um, so you know you can target you can target markets that are off East Asia, Japan, um, Korea, uh, the the west coast of the U.S., Mediterranean. It really opens up up the markets. Um, in Equinor, we have a, um, a a target of 12 to 16 gigawatts of of renewable power by 2035, and we see floating wind playing a large uh, role in that. So do you see any, uh, you know, the, in a previous topic, we talk about electrification, the challenges of electrification of the platform. Do you see the floating wind turbines would solve their problem for the deep, deep water platforms to provide power? Yes, so closer to, we, have a, we, we have um, um, a project ongoing that will start up next year. It's called High Wind uh, Tampon. This is... Um, a project, you know, a concept with uh, 11 floating uh, wind turbines supplying 88 megawatts of power to uh, to two fields in the Tampin area in the Norwegian continental shelf. So this is deep water. This is around 300 meters of water. So floating wind was your only option there. Um, and 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 it it also uh, will be a a great demonstrator of uh, synchronization of wind in general but floating wind in this case with gas turbines on platforms because you need you need you need that steady and reliable supply of electricity uh, uh, floating wind uh, and wind is intermittent so yeah you have yeah. to synchronize the operation of gas turbines and wind because the gas tur turbines are your backup uh, you need to have a power management system that can that, well it's basically it's taking into account the weather prediction short term medium term the uh, the power demand on your on your platform uh, integration between platforms and and so you've got this uh, system that has to keep everything in, 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 in harmony so that you don't have load shedding so yes it is a, it is an, an 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 option it's one we're going to demonstrate as I said from next year uh, it it won't get you full uh, decarbonization so if you're going to because you need your gas turbines as backup yeah yeah so exactly you, you know so yeah. that's the yeah that's a challenge for all you know the renewable power which are intermittent like solar and wind and all that we need to fill that gap with the hydrogen or anything else you know uh, to remove that intermittency issue go ahead david hartel yeah one yeah one of the the good points that uh, david makes there about the intermittency 
Um, we're going to come to it a little bit later in the panel, but one of the ideas that people have is use the wind turbines to produce the bulk of your power. But when they aren't, when they aren't able to, the fact that you might have been able to produce uh, excess electricity earlier and perhaps uh, made hydrogen and stored that in some manner, um, these gas turbines that he mentions um, don't necessarily have to be hydrocarbon gas. It might be, uh, it might be hydrogen powered. So uh, if you could come up with the, the best, some economic ways of storing that volume of hydrogen, maybe down hole, uh, maybe in a solid form uh, in metal hydrides, in a, in a module on the seabed, there's that offers some uh, some hope that you'll have base load combined with the intermittent wind. That's great, thanks, uh, Dave, Steve, uh, Neil, or Paul. <clears throat> Any comments? Uh, no, I think most things are covered here. I mean, the, the challenge, as has been highlighted, is the is the intermittency and how can you manage those power demands, um, which talks to, again, not looking at this in an isolated way. It talks to how can you potentially link multiple different um, energy uh, sources and energy sinks in a more flexible and adaptive way. So you, then you can start to, to manage those intermittency problems. Energy storage is going to be required, but it's always going to be challenging and expensive. So you want to be able to minimize that energy storage uh, pieces in there. So hydrogen does offer an opportunity, but we need to be more intelligent about our energy consumption uh, and be more responsive to the to the opportunities that the energy provides us. Great, thank you. Go ahead, Paul. I agree with Steve on the on the uh, energy storage side. The, there's a lot of work being done and, and a good bit of success to this point um, in in um, developing hydrogen turbine capacity. And um, I I. I liked uh, some of what David was saying about the, the creative and, and sort of novel ways to think about storing that hydrogen to help solve the intermittency problem. Whether uh, one of the other things that we hear talked about a lot is is converting that hydrogen to ammonia and using that as the storage medium um, as as uh, being a little easier to handle perhaps than the pure hydrogen. But uh, as Steve mentioned, it's all expensive and that sort of takes you back to the ETS and the, the carbon taxes and the like to create the economic viability and the regulatory certainty that's going to be essential. Good, good point. Thanks, Paul. Uh, yeah, go ahead, David. Granger. So the, the other way to get, I think, uh, full decarbonization or offshore operations using, you know, intermittent wind as a cost to have backup from shore. So we have, we've talked about storage is the one the one way to do it. The other is is to to have a cable out from from shore. And this brings me back to the first point I, I made about using offshore emissions reduction as a kickstarter for new value chains, because you can also envisage that the infrastructure you build uh, in in you know, power from shore up to these platforms, you can see, um, you know, expansion of wind in the area, and you can eventually use those cables to export power to shore. So it's the first step uh, in, in building an infrastructure that can live on after your oil and gas platforms eventually shut down. It's good. Any comment? Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Um, yeah, and and that. As I think it's already been said that in Norway, where you've got an abundance of green power, um, but in other places where you haven't got an abundance of green power onshore, cabling it from onshore from a gas fire uh, power station is probably not gonna, not going to do your carbon footprint uh, any good. But it's interesting. I mean, one point that um, so this, you know, as we decarbonize the existing installations, one of the other things it opens up. Um, going forward is is potential reuse of these assets post COP. So uh, you know, as gas fields or oil fields fall off, if we've already electrified these installations with all the necessary uh, associated electrical equipment, etc., on there, it makes the optioneering part of uh, as you approach COP a lot a lot more interesting. In that, well, perhaps we can just take the oil and our gas uh, processing facilities off and replace them with hydrogen or um, carbon capture or whatever. So, you know, in the process of electrifying um, these offshore installations, we do open up the discussion a bit further about, right, what can we reuse these things for? And perhaps 
abate some of the decommissioning or all of the decommissioning costs. Thank you. So let's talk about the cost. Uh, David, do you have any view on, you know, the, the floating wind versus fixed? The cost profiles are different. Is it worth it, you know, using the floating wind versus fixed if the cost is higher? Yeah, it's, 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 it's true that, that uh, bottom fixed wind is cheaper than, than floating wind at the moment. We've seen a huge cost uh, reduction over the steps, the uh, scale up steps we've undertaken so far. So the first um, demonstrator was a two megawatt floating wind uh, turbine off of off, off Norway, and it, you know, it had a, a pretty high levelized cost of electricity. Um, that was decreased, or the capex was decreased by seventy percent, to the next um, installation, which was a high wind Scotland, which is thirty megawatts, seventy percent down, and now it's another forty percent decrease um, from high wind Scotland to to high wind Tampin. So there is a, a steep um, a cost decrease curve. Um, so we, we believe that with the next steps, which are commercial sized uh, wind parks, 200, 500 megawatts, and then building up to a gigawatt, that you know, through scale of the actual turbines themselves, uh, through industrialization and, and standardization of the, of, of, the, of the production of these floating wind uh, turbines, and then also the experience we're gaining through the projects that we can, we expect a convergence of the liberalized cost electricity uh, in the 2030s, early 2030s, where it'll come down to about 40 to 60 euros per megawatt hour. So it's uh, absolutely worth it. And as I said earlier, this, I think there's probably four times the potential for floating wind in terms of capacity as a bottom fixed. And once so. you scale it, it also helps, right, with the cost profile. Right. So scaling of the actual turbine. I mean, we have uh, eight mm -hmm. megawatt turbines in Tampin, and to, to continue to, to increase the size of those turbines will, will be a benefit. That's great. Uh, anyone else? Any comment? Yeah, I, I yeah, mean, what? there was a... Oh, sorry, David. Well, one of the... We, we had a... Uh, a question in the uh, chat area on the main platform about that uh, was briefly touched on uh, in our panel about the idea that as offshore uh, wind farms scale up, the idea of taking off some of that electricity offshore and keeping it offshore for the platforms, uh, there's a number of good technical papers where people have showed how that's possible, that uh, the idea that that all the 100% of the power doesn't have to go to the shore, it could stay offshore and uh, power some of these platforms. And some of these platforms um, are being uh, evaluated for being converted into uh, trans transformer platforms for some offshore wind farms. So there, I, and I liked uh, the comment about uh, once we have the electrical infrastructure out there, after we're done with the oil and gas, if we're not using something for carbon capture and storage, perhaps then more of that electricity can then head back to shore. Thanks, David. Uh, Steve, well, you were saying something. Yeah, just in terms of kind of the, the cost of offshore wind. So, I mean, whether that's floating or fixed, if you go back a few years, you know, it was uh, it was a very expensive form of, of energy. But, uh, you know, now, you know, off the prediction is by, I think, 2030, offshore wind will be the cheapest form of uh, wind electricity generation. Okay? That, that's currently um, fixed bottom uh, pieces. So, significantly cheaper than uh, power generated from combined cycle gas turbines and, and other sources of kind of fossil fuel uh, generation only only beaten by solar in uh, the the sunnier parts of the world so offshore wind is an incredibly cheap form of energy for the future uh, and uh, the developments that we're seeing around floating are converging the uh, the prices of floating towards that um, off fixed. So either is going to be dependent on where your platform is, um, which is the most appropriate um, source. It's not going to be a um, a floating or fixed by choice. It'll be driven by the economics. And if you're in shallow water, then you're going to go for a for a fixed based system. And if you're in deep water, you'll be in a, um, uh, the other system. So That's everything broken. is very yeah. positive towards the uh, uh, very positive towards uh, offshore wind, which is uh, which is fantastic because that is a huge source of energy that can be distributed in many of the key parts of the world. <laughs> 
Yeah, so so I have a last question on this topic for everybody. You know, so I see that the cost has come down uh, for the renewable energy overall. You know, uh, and it's 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 moving in the right direction. The cost is so. What do you? What's your view? So how much cost we have? You know, whatever we have reduced so far. Do you think the same trajectory will continue? And uh, it, it, at some point, it will be very. It, it will be a no-brainer. You know, to deploy renewable form of energy. From the cost perspectives, cost would not be a, a decision maker. Uh, if it, the, the challenge with platforms is slightly different because you've got the co-location problem. But if you're just simply talking about deploying renewables, uh, it is already a no-brainer. Uh, whether you're kind of uh, wind or solar, it dramatically undercuts the price of any other form of power generation. Right? Um, it also has the ability that it can be deployed anywhere in the world. So you've got societal um, acceptance and uh, engagement um, in that piece. Here we've got a, a unique right. challenge where we're talking about platforms and, and co-locating platforms and power. And, and that's more complicated because of the expense of the cables. Sorry, David. Great, thanks. Yeah, Go ahead, Dave. One, of the, one of the challenges with renewables, of course, is you can't just compare the cost of the particular hardware, the solar hardware, the wind hardware. It is the intermittency and, and being able to, uh, to deal with that. We're, we're lucky that offshore wind is more persistent and, and higher than, than nearshore wind or onshore wind, but still it has some intermittency. And over the past year, uh, global wind energy has reduced uh, something called global um, wind stilling by 15 percent so you should you should keep that in your mind that uh how will you how will you meet the demand requirements of your equipment so uh if you're onshore and you have a mixture of, of energy sources that's easier than a platform platform is going to have equipment that needs to run 24 7 365 days a year so if you have wind you you have to have a plan b for the intermittency getting some form of energy storage and it may be that you can afford power from shore uh, to, to help you deal with that. But if you're too far offshore, uh, as I was pointing out, that's very expensive. So you should come up with something else, which I think is our next topic, which is hydrogen. Yeah, that's a very good segue to our next topic, actually, intermittency. You know, how can we solve that problem? So that's what I'm so from our discussion so far, I can see that the biggest challenge, the cost is not a big issue right now. The only biggest challenge that we need to solve is the intermittency. So hydrogen plays a role there and hydrogen is the most abundant in el element in the universe. But do you know all that? Always, it can be used to decarbonize the role of hydrogen in transition and some of the challenges. Uh, if you can talk about that, um, anyone want to start? Where hydrogen play a role in the challenges? Yeah, go ahead, Neil. Yeah, so um, hydrogen is. Um, you know, we've got. I mean, I think we've got a question on it later on about the color spectrum of hydrogen. But you know, there's a big focus on green hydrogen, which is which is uh, aspirational in terms of um, the production where it uses renewable energy to generate or, or it's, it's using renewable energy to power the electrolysis process. Uh, when we burn uh, hydrogen, it's, it's clean, it emits no emissions. Um, but the problem, uh, one of the issues that we've got here is the aspirations, particularly in the UK, of hydrogen-based economy is uh, well, a few things actually. It's it's it is a hazardous in industry, which the oil and gas industry is used to. Uh, it's producing at scale that we that we are talking about in terms of um, uh, the the production of hydrogen. It's the transportation of it through infrastructure or through um, tankers or however we want to do it. And then of course it's the offtake because without the infrastructure to get hydrogen into houses, offices, factories transportation systems etc um we can produce all the hydrogen we want in the world um but if we can't get anybody to take it then uh, we've got a major problem so hydrogen is a part of the solution um and but we are we are far from being able to do what we aspire to do with hydrogen so far thanks uh, neil go ahead paul yeah, I think Baker Hughes is pretty bullish on hydrogen. I, th I think we see it as a long-term significant contributor 
um, to the climate problem. Um, we're we're sort of um, um, open ended as far as the colors are concerned. We, as I said earlier, it's the emissions, not the fuels, that are the problem. And and so if you if you can use gas to generate the hydrogen and then sequester the emissions through CCUS, that's to us that's as good as green hydrogen. Um, and I, you know, I we we talk a lot about the energy transition, and and so you know, if you go back, say, a hundred, hundred and twenty years, we're we're shifting from horse-drawn buggies and buggy whips to all the way today to super highways, right? And it and it took time, and it took a major uh, public-private partnership, right, with with uh, public uh, with the, the the private sector providing new technologies in the way of cars and all the, all the rest. And the government coming along and supporting the sort of the backbone, the superhighways, the, the 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 core infrastructure that that made it possible to use these new technologies. So when we think about this this public-private partnership, this collaboration um, on a on a very clear and very consistent and very reliable um, strategy to go from where we are today to where we need to be. Um, Includes hydrogen, and and it's just going to be essential if we're going to if we're going to make progress. Otherwise, we're just sort of throwing stuff at the wall. Mm -hmm. So thanks, Paul. So go ahead, Steve. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, thanks. Um, I, just back to your question, really, Nadine. It was around kind of you know, fundamentally which industries are going to benefit. So you know, um, we're very much um, bullish about hydrogen as well. We've got our green electrolyzer um, company. Um, in partnership with the CEA to, to fundamentally generate those technologies as well as blue hydrogen pieces. But, you know, you, you look in the press and they suggest hydrogen can solve everything, right? But it, it does come at a price, you know? So um, there are what are kind of termed the hydrogen unavoidable industries. So there are certain industries where hydrogen is the cheapest method to be able to decarbonize those systems. And then you've got lots of other industries or lots of other applications where hydrogen could be used, but currently is probably too expensive and unrealistic to be used. Right? So if you think about things like the chemicals industry, the ammonia and fertilizer industries, the iron and steel industries, um, a lot of the kind of those areas, uh, hydrogen is probably the only realistic method economically to be able to decarbonize those. Then you've got all of the other pieces, which until the prices come down dramatically, probably won't move forward. So there are places like in the UK, um, the announcements with you know Equinor and BP uh, and ENI and others. Uh, the government strategy is very much focused on deliver hydrogen to those hydrogen unavoidable industries, be able to help those decarbonize. Then you can scale out the whole hydrogen economy. You can drive down the prices, and then you can start to scale out whether that be blue or green, depending on the use case. Sorry, David. It's a good point. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, all, all very good points. So I'll try and add a few. Um, I mean, there's there's no scenario, no credible net zero scenario, I think, without hydrogen. Hydrogen it can be used to abate, hard to abate sectors, as Steve was um, was telling us. Um, it's also a way of storing energy on a massive scale. So if you think of um, hydrogen storage and salt cabins, that's a way to do seasonal storage, something that batteries can't do at this this point. Um, hydrogen is already used in massive quantities. I think maybe 90 million tons or so is produced and used every year. It's consumed more or less on site, of course, in things like fertilizers um, and in refineries. But you know, we need to replace that with low carbon hydrogen at some point. So that's why we have um, we have a um, an ambition yeah, to have hydrogen projects in three to five clusters around the world by 2035 and have produced at least 10 percent of europe's hydrogen uh, because we really we really see that this will be um, a, a huge market and, a, and an extremely important instrument in decarbonizing energy systems um, i'd like to link it back a little bit to our main topic which is um, you know, decarbonization of CO2 offshore. Um, hydrogen, low carbon hydrogen, to be truly low carbon, needs to have clean energy inputs. So if it's green hydrogen, you need to have 
electricity that is uh, essentially renewable. If it's blue hydrogen, you need to have a number of elements in place to really truly be low carbon. I mean, the first is that you, you're going to convert your natural gas uh, to hydrogen and you're going to produce CO2 in that conversion process and you need to capture at least 95% of it. That's our ambition. You, you need to have relatively clean power input to your process if you're importing power. Yeah, you need to have an efficient process, so at least 75% gas efficiency on your process. But what's it received a lot of attention recently and, and what's an important part of your greenhouse gas footprint of hydrogen are your upstream emissions. And that's both the, uh, the direct CO2 emissions uh, from power production, but also methane, as I think Dave Hartel was saying earlier. You know, methane is a much more powerful global uh, warming gas. And um, we really need to keep an eye on that as an oil and gas industry, because that really shows up in the gas, uh, the GHG footprint of your hydrogen. Uh, on the Norwegian side, on the NCS, the gas coming out of the NCS is, is very low in terms of methane emissions. So it's something like 0.03% of the gas that's delivered to the customers. So that's, that's low. You don't really see that. Um, doesn't have high visibility in your greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, the UKCS is good as well. Uh, the OGCI average is 0.2% uh, methane loss. Uh, is still enough to get you uh, into the low carbon category um, of less than three kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen uh, produced. But um, that's not the case for everywhere in the world. So we do have regions which produce natural gas with high uh, methane emissions. And it's really in the interest of everybody who um, has a long-term strategy to produce blue hydrogen, to roll out blue hydrogen, uh, that, we can, um, that we can bring down those, those methane emissions. Because we, we don't want just one area developing one or two plants based on the cleanest gas. We need the whole industry to produce clean gas. Thanks, David. Uh, unfortunately, our, our moderator, Nordine, had to step away for uh, 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 another scheduled meeting, but uh, I'm going to help uh, take us the final 21 minutes for the panel. Um, one of the uh, things that always uh, interests me, and I'd be interested in what you guys have to think about this, is uh, there's a lot of chatter about the co these colors of hydrogen and the idea, does that matter? And so we've got, uh, the, the, we've just, just been discussing blue hydrogen produced produced from, uh, from hydrocarbons. And uh, some people are very upset if you say, well, yes, I'm gonna make blue hydrogen, but, but I'm gonna capture that CO2 and I'm gonna store it away. So doesn't that make my hydrogen green now, the fact that I've done that? So it seems to be, uh, you know, to me, if you're putting your arms around the whole production cycle of the hydrogen, if you've captured the emissions, why isn't that green? So we've got different, ways of making the hydrogen and almost any form of hydrogen was 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 originally judged to be important to be able to scale up all of our facilities our manufacturing facilities the transportation facilities the the power use and everything so blue hydrogen had its role but we we do have the ability now with carbon capture and storage technology is getting so much better to capture those emissions so i was interested what you guys had to think about that aspect Um, yeah, it is. I mean, the, the, the most interesting in hydrogen to me is pink hydrogen, um, which is produced from nuclear power. And if you look at the work that Rolls-Royce have done, for instance, on small modular reactors, you kind of look at what they're doing and you think, why are we doing anything else? Um, but, you know, that's another colour to come in. But it's all about, I mean, blue, green, it's all about, and, I, and David touched on it, it's where you get your power from to, to actually power the process. It's the biggest difference. And then, you know, um, grey hydrogen is blue without the carbon capture. So, you know, and carbon capture is such an important part of the whole process and it's a, such an important part of decarbonising any industry because if you can capture the emissions and do something with them, um, then you've got, you've got it. But... The, the other interesting aspect for me is, is, the, is the energy efficiency between green hydrogen and blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is far more efficient to burn than green hydrogen is. So the, there's, a, there's an ongoing debate in the 
with the scientists, of which I'm not one. I've just read a lot about it um, as to which is more, which, which is future. I think blue hydrogen is going to be a massive part of the whole energy transition. Um, so it is going to be a big driver until green hydrogen and others catch up with it. Um, and at some point, green hydrogen will become a reality at scale. Um, but again, then in green hydrogen, price per kilowatt hour at the moment is more expensive than price per kilowatt hour of blue hydrogen because by the time you've added on the renewable energy costs to the to the the actual hydrogen costs it makes it more expensive so the this is all about a, a, a time phase so they will all catch up at some point and there will all be a balance of mixture of, of solutions out there but um it is a it's it's a hot debate and um and then of course you've got white hydrogen which is naturally formed under the ground but that requires fracking which is you know, you go into any room and talk about fracking for stuff, then you've got a problem. And there's only a limited known reserves of that around the world. So, um, yeah, so, so it's interested in terms of types of nitrogen. Yeah. Nitrogen. So, I mean, yeah. Steve, Steve, so, uh, Steve yeah. you guys are making uh, electrolyzers. Uh, how much are you going to be able to scale those up and get the price down to, to make uh, hydrogen produced from electrolyzers to be uh, the price we need? Um, I, I think all of the major electrolyzed uh, manufacturers, including ourselves, are, think that by 2030, then there should be sufficient price parity to, to address a number of different um, industrial use cases. As I say, this, the, there is this uh, alignment that's required between what the industrial use case is and what the price point is that those industrial use cases can uh, can take. Now, there, there's also, and I think most of us in the in the hydrogen business um, don't care that much about the color as long as it has a low emissions footprint, right? So, so we're involved in both blue and green, same as Equinor, same as uh, Baker, lots of other other folks, right? Um, the world is going to need more hydrogen than we can produce from either blue or green. What we want to be able to do is scale out the use of hydrogen and the hydrogen economy as quickly as possible. Now, at the same time, we do need to ensure that the hydrogen we are producing is genuinely of low emissions, right? And then this is partly back to, to David's point here. If you take uh, methane from a bunch of different parts of the world where say the emissions rate are greater than 3%, it is not decarbonizing the end solution. So you need to have a methane emissions rate, which is you know well below really a percent to be able to have a significant overall um, cradle to grave decarbonizing effect. The, the point of using hydrogen is to decarbonize industries. And so if we kind of ignore the emissions that are happening over here, but we've decarbonized this piece over here, fundamentally we've not achieved anything apart from make a very expensive um, global machine. Okay? So, so absolutely, yeah. it's, it's absolutely critical um, in that particular place. In terms of pricing as well, one of the key aspects here is blue and green have different values. You know, blue, is not as pure unless you do extra purification steps as green, right? And so in that case, it's very good as a combustion source. So if you want high temperature industrial processes, blue is a cheaper way of being able to scale those pieces out. If you want four, five, nines purity hydrogen, then green electrolysis is the more efficient potential way of doing that. And so if you wanna use it for fuel cells, for mobility, then green hydrogen is the more natural choice in those particular cases. So you can create them in different regions of the world at different price points, and they have better use cases for different industries. I got a question for uh, David. Uh, Neptune Energy has a project offshore Netherlands where they have a pilot uh, uh, offshore wind powered uh, desalination of seawater with a one megawatt electrolyzer producing 400 kilograms of green hydrogen per day. Uh, it's a great pilot example. I was curious, uh, with your offshore uh, wind uh, assets that Equinor has, have you been looking at making uh, hydrogen offshore um, in any of your facilities right now or planned? I can say that we are um, we are part of uh, two projects in, 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 in Europe, North H2 and uh, Aqua Sector, where... Um, the, the purpose is to have dedicated wind parks uh, to, to green hydrogen. And um, initially, 
your North H2 will be hydrogen production onshore. Um, but the end game is to move hydrogen production offshore as well. So um, we don't have any um, any plans at the moment to, to produce green hydrogen uh, offshore in our own <laughs> installations. Um, of course, we have a very active R&D department considering all, all options, but uh, nothing concrete. But um, we do see that, the, that there's a potential there. So um, any of you all, do you believe that there's a chance that some of these offshore facilities after they, um, in, the, uh, in their oil and gas production, might shift over to some sort of offshore hydrogen production? Uh, maybe trying to use some of the same pipelines. Uh, what's the chance of that? Uh, what's what's the prospects for that? What do you guys think? It, well, I think David, as I said earlier, is if you're successful in electrifying an offshore installation, um, then the when you reach the optioneering stage of towards COP, you just decide what you're going to do with it. It then brings the reuse or repurpose option more to the table in that right can we actually now we've got the electricity on the platform because quite often you'll find that and i think david touched on it early on in that if you're going to bring electricity on the platform in that form then they're probably going to need another jacket alongside it to house the electrical equipment to allow the electricity to be used on the platform so if you're going to do that and and i think uh, steve touched on it earlier as well so looking at, at them as, as transformer platform possibly to export power but you can then credibly look at well if we put a hydrogen generating station on here we've got the power already let's produce green hydrogen is the pipeline capable of exporting it well that's a big debate point at the moment as to whether you know the existing infrastructure can can act, actually transport hyd uh, hydrogen or whether it needs coating or whatever but in answer to your question yeah, absolutely i think yeah if you if you've already got electricity on that platform from wind or from shore, then, yeah. Steve. Yeah, um, yeah. There's, there's there's an interesting kind of uh, playoff here, and again, it comes back to to costs, right? So, and, and what you're going to do with hydrogen? So, once you've kind of uh, if all if what you're doing is taking electricity, transforming it to hydrogen, and then you transform it back to electricity, that that's one usage. The the, the long term energy storage piece that still requires a very expensive cable going from your platform to shore. Okay? And so so that has to factor mm -hmm. into it. But if you wanna keep it as, and, and you lose efficiency every time you transfer energy from one type to another. Right? So, um, but if you wanna keep it as hydrogen, as a molecule, so you can go from wind to hydrogen production, and then you transmit the hydrogen along a pipeline to shore, um, and the end consumer wants to consume hydrogen, then you no longer need to, to build a um, very expensive uh, cable between your platform and shore. Uh, and a pipeline distribution of hydrogen is significantly cheaper at longer distances than uh, an electrical cable. So there are certain scenarios with certain configurations where it does look like it would be quite beneficial to be able to stack electrolyzers um, in um, high uh, wind offshore places where there is pipeline infrastructure to a place which wants to consume hydrogen directly. Okay, David. Just to add to what Steve was saying is that, you know, in as he says, long term trans long long distance transport of hydrogen is often done more efficiently, um, you know, by pipeline. Um, rather than converting it to electricity and converting it and, and, and transporting it. And when it comes to pipelines, you have two options. You can, you can invest in new pipelines specifically for hydrogen transport. The other option is to, to consider it, you know, existing pipelines, which are repurposed. So there's a, there's a lot of activity around that at the moment as well. Uh, okay. We've got five minutes to go. Uh, just time for a, time for a, a quick closing comment from each of you with it in the last five minutes here. Uh, Neil. Yeah. I was just going to add to that last conversation is that, um, you know, I've, I've touched on it earlier. So uh, the, the carbon taxation regime will be a big factor in whether the reuse of, uh, offshore assets is, uh, is, is done because it's a lever that any government can pull and wants to pull it then um, you know it'll encourage an awful lot of projects to be then looked at viably um, 
Uh, closing comment. Uh, no, um, it's a fascinating subject. All, all the topics that we've touched on, hydrogen in particular, um, and I watch and read and see lots and lots of interesting stuff on that. But like I said, my my pet interest at the moment is pink hydrogen. Steve. Uh, yeah, it's great that we're having this debate. I think it's uh, it's uh, absolutely a requirement on all of the individuals, all of the companies and all of the governments to be able to step up their decarbonisation uh, efforts. Uh, we want to drive decarbonisation and we want to be in line um, and deliver uh, Paris and keep the world below one and a half degrees C. Uh, to do that, we need to do it economically and feasibly. So it's going to need the best brains, the best minds coming together with actions to be able to decarbonize, drive greater energy efficiency, and then drive towards uh, net zero. Okay, David. Yeah, thank you. So um, offshore decarbonization is, is an integral part of, of, of whole chain decarbonization. Absolutely, you know, absolutely essential. We've had a very technical discussion today, which is great for an, ex, an engineer but i think uh, we should also touch on um, three important things to make this happen so the first is policy support policy framework um, revenue mechanisms and um, and business models that will help us to invest in and initiate these these large-scale uh, energy transition measures uh, to our customers uh, for hydrogen uh, need support uh, they need to be developed. We have a, a large focus on, on sort of oil and gas production, decarbonization, hydrogen production. The use is just as important to stimulate. Um, and, and, and finally, the role that then that private uh, public partnership can play in that. So I'll leave it with those thoughts. All right. Well, thanks very much to, uh, to the, all the panelists and uh, Nordine Taj. Uh, who had to leave us for uh, for kicking off the moderating on this. I'm going to close with a quote that I enjoyed yesterday from Joe Coleman at Shell. She paraphrased a Heineken beer advertisement and said, hydrogen reaches the parts electrons can't reach. So I <laughs> had a good laugh yesterday morning for that. But uh, it, it's interesting, you know, hybrid energy uh, mixes are going to be uh, more robust, uh, more sustainable. And the idea of a circular economy using facilities uh, one way, switching it around another way. We heard some good things today. So thanks very much to everybody. I'd like to hand back to uh, uh, Adam and uh, the organizers.